Hello everybody and welcome to our Music, Health and Wellbeing workshop. We were just listening to a beautiful performance by the talented musicians of Manchester Camerata. I hope you all enjoyed that. My name is Anne-Marie Nunez and I work at the University of Manchester and I manage a project called Creative Manchester. Just a, a very brief word on Creative Manchester. Um, we're a four year project entirely funded and based within the University of Manchester. And the project really bridges the gap between academia, the community and the cultural sector. We create collaborative projects, partnerships with cultural and arts organizations, with community projects and with grassroots organizations. You'll hear lots about Creative Manchester's work, partnerships and collaborations today, so I won't dwell too much on the detail. But one of the key strands of work that we're involved in is arts and health. And so we're delighted to host this event today. And it's, a, it's really a pleasure to see how many people are engaged in, in the, the huge impact that music can have on our health and well-being. This workshop today is part of the ESRC Festival of Social Sciences, and we're very grateful for the funding that we've received to be able to host this event today. So thank you to them. And there are lots of events taking place throughout the rest of the week that you may also be interested in. Before we start the workshop today, I've got some brief housekeeping notes and some Zoom etiquette, which seems to be the norm nowadays. Um, so just to go through those quickly with you, we're asking that all participants keep their cameras switched off other than panelists and guest speakers until the breakout sessions. And then of course, feel free to switch your camera on. Please stay muted throughout the session just so we can avoid background noises. And just a reminder that today's session is being recorded. Now the, the session is being recorded, but the breakout rooms will not be recorded. If you could also set your view within Zoom to speak of you, and then you will see the, the person who is, uh, who is speaking. And we'll be spotlighting lighting speakers so they become um, clearer throughout the, the, the part that they're speaking in. And to point out that today we're joined by two BSL interpreters. If you, you would like to access this facility, then please search for them in the participants list. They're listed as BSL Russ and BSL Sam. And then if you could pin them to you, uh, your Zoom profile for the duration of the event, you will be able to see them throughout. If you'd like to choose view side by side, you can view the BSL interpreter alongside the guest speaker. Okay, we're, we're very lucky today to have a very fantastic range of speakers and panelists for today's event. Unfortunately, we won't have time to unmute everybody and clap after each individual speaker. Uh, but if you do want to show your appreciation after a speaker has finished, then please feel free to use the clap function in reactions. And you can find this at the very bottom bar of your Zoom screen. There will be time for you to engage and interact and to ask questions later on in the event. We will be using um, the chat function for this. So if you can type your question into the chat function, once again, you'll find this at the very bottom of your Zoom bar. We will be using the chat function mostly just to manage queries and questions. Uh, we won't be using it to, um, for participants to share details and to introduce themselves today. And finally, if you are a Twitter user, then please do tweet about today's event using the hashtag ESRC Festival. Now I have the, the very important job of trying to, to time keep for today's event. We have three packed hours together to explore this topic of music health and well-being. So I will be making sure that we run to time and that we manage to fit in everything that we've got planned for you this afternoon. So I'm not going to break my own rules by overrunning. Um, so I'll move on. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce my colleague and chair for today's event, Professor Caroline Bithell, who is head of music at the University of Manchester. Thank you, everybody. And I really hope that you enjoy today's event. Thank you. So a very warm welcome from me on behalf of the music department. Practice-based work in the field of participatory music plays an important part in our degree programmes and our students are engaged in a range of outreach projects in community and educational settings. 
We also host a music health and wellbeing research group that focuses on the many ways in which music making supports the well-being of individuals and communities. And part of our aim is to bring ethnographic and social scientific approaches into dialogue with the methods and insights of practitioners as a way of strengthening the evidence for the value of music as a tool for individual transformation and social change. Today's event has grown out of recent collaborative work between myself, Professor John Keady from the School of Health Sciences and Manchester Camerata. And for this workshop, we wanted to bring together a range of different voices and perspectives, those of academic researchers, musicians and therapists, policymakers, and healthcare professionals. In considering the many benefits of musical participation, we'll be zooming in to focus more particularly on the value of musical engagement for older people and for those living with dementia. So we'll be beginning with a set of four lightning talks to set the scene and to establish some core frames of reference. These will be given by myself, by John Keady, Professor of Older People's Mental Health, Virginia Tandy, Director of the Creative Agency, Aging, sorry, Development Agency, and Bev Taylor, who is Operations Director for the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Following a short break, we'll then have a presentation about Manchester Camerata's Camerata in the Community Programme. And we'll then have the opportunity to discuss some of the themes and issues raised with the help of a panel and a Q&A session before moving into breakout rooms where we can continue the discussion in smaller groups. But first, we have a short welcome address on the power of music from Mark Radcliffe. Mark studied English and American studies here at Manchester in the 1970s. He went on to become a regular presenter of music documentaries and one of the long-standing anchors of the BBC's coverage of the Glastonbury Festival, among other things. And last year, he celebrated 40 years in radio. So we're delighted to have Mark with us today. A warm welcome over to you, Mark. All right, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Is everybody there? Great. All right, thanks very much. Um, uh, well, I'm very happy to be here. I guess I'm the uh, the fluff before you get the proper experts on. Um, and uh, I'll put me a uh, stopwatch on, then I don't talk for too long. I'm here because um, uh, Lizzie from Manchester Camerata used to be my producer for many years, and she's told me how and that it mustn't be over a certain length. And I've always been terrified of her, even when we were working together. So it will be it will be the right length, but very happy to be involved. Music has been uh, the thread through my life. When I, uh, I grew up in a house of music, my mum played the piano. My dad was a reviewer for papers like the Sunday Times and uh, the Daily Mail. I've often said my first big gig was David Bowie at the Manchester Hard Rock in 1972. It's not true. My first gig would have been uh, Handel's Messiah at the Free Trade Hall, where with, uh, with uh, the Halle Orchestra and uh, my dad was a pal of John Barbaroli so I met him uh, back in the day. Um, as he said I was at Manchester University um, where I was uh, studying English and American literature but I was um, in the Electric Band Society because my life as a schoolboy had never been very sporty and my life as a schoolboy and as a student was enriched once I found my gangs of people, my people who were all musicians, all people in bands. And I enjoyed the camaraderie of that so much. And I still do to this day. And I think that's helped me through some very, very hard times, being able to um, not just make music, but also to be with like-minded people who are on your wavelength. And I've always found that I don't know what I would do, what my life would have been like without that. And also working in radio. Um, you know, um, every day there's been escape, even in the hardest times, there's been escape through through music. Um, in fact, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because um, I was um, diagnosed with neck and throat cancer a couple of years ago and uh, went through a lot of, of tough treatment. And um, music helped me a lot to get through that. I found my thoughts very much turned to how people had overcome um, obstacles in their life and how much a part of music 
had, had played in that. And in fact, that became the theme of this book, which is uh, called uh, Crossroads, which is, which, which is my latest book, which is about the power of music to help people through. And sometimes to find solutions that they wouldn't have expected. Um, you know, some of the stories in that book are people like Tony Iommi, who was the lead guitarist in Black Sabbath. Um, and the day before he left to be a professional musician, he went to his job at the steel foundry and cut the tops of three of his fingers off on a, um, a, a, a lathe or a, some kind of guillotine press. That was it. So obviously not the ideal preparation for becoming a professional guitarist is to lose three fingers. But because of that and taking inspiration from the gypsy jazz guitarist Django Reinhardt, who'd lost some fingers as well, and was probably, I think, the greatest jazz guitarist that has ever lived. Tony Iommi thought, well, what can I do to overcome this? And one of the things he did was to make himself fingertips out of fairy liquid bottle tops. And another thing he did, because it hurt when he pressed the strings down, was to slacken the strings off. And that um, made the tension less, and so it wasn't as painful, but also it gave his guitar and Black Sabbath that deep churning, growling sound. And so rather marvellously, and this is an anecdote I've trotted out many times, he invented heavy metal after an accident with some heavy metal. Uh, but it, it does show you that sometimes um, that urge and that need to be involved in music, to keep making music, to have that creative input and connection with something can make you overcome so many things. Brian Eno is in the book and he sort of created ambient music because he'd been in a car crash and he was bedridden and um, someone came to see him and put a record on as they were leaving. I think it was some uh, harp music actually and he realised once they'd gone that only it was on too quietly and only one speaker on his stereo system was working but he couldn't move to turn it up but gradually he realized that the music was blending with the rain outside and the environment and the sounds um, just at large and that created this idea of listening to music not in the foreground but as part of the kind of whole sphere of your experience at that time and that sort of he would never have been in that situation had he not had an accident, had he not faced this adversity and very trying time. And out of that um, comes great discovery and great possibilities. So I think a lot of what I was thinking with writing this book, Crossroads, as I sort of came to a crossroads in my life, was, you know, sometimes life, illness, dementia throws things at you that you never really expect to have to deal with. But it also opens up an opportunity to take the road less traveled because the road you thought you were going to go down perhaps doesn't become available to you anymore. And so a series of accidents and adversities and experiences that might be not what you intended or wanted might send you to on a path of discovery that otherwise you would never have taken. Um, <laughs> I, my mum's in a care home in Morecambe and uh, she's got dementia. I haven't been have any physical contact with her since February. And so that's been difficult, uh, most particularly for her. But one of the things that's really intriguing is how um, I can unlock memories of hers by playing her some music from long ago that I remember hearing as a child in her house. So she could still come alive when she is the voice of Andy Williams. And who can blame her? He's one of the greatest singers ever in popular music. I love Andy. Andy Williams singing Moon River is still one of the greatest things you can hear. It's one of the most romantic concert. Two drifters off to see the world. Wow, what's a better concept than that? And so <laughs> that unlocks it. And from that music, she can then talk to me about the, my very earliest memories, my sketchy memories of being a kid and where we lived. And then she takes some solace from all those family memories coming back. She can't remember what she ate um, than the last meal she had, but she can remember the details of a flat we lived in, in um, Bishop's Court, just off Bishop's Avenue, London N2, which she told me this morning, I had a FaceTime with her. And she said, yes, I think it was London N2, that flat. And so those details come back and that can be unlocked by the power of music. So 
music has been my companion through life. It's been my work. It's been everything to me. It still is everything to me. Um, I still love making music. I, I still listen to music constantly. Uh, my relaxation is to put a vinyl record on and watch it going round. It's vital to me. But it also helped me very much overcome my darkest days in the aftermath of my cancer treatment when I felt terrible and I couldn't eat and I was being sick all the time. And um, just writing and thinking about these people in music who'd um, faced these crossroads and and come out of it creating something new and amazing um, really gave me strength and to see on a personal note the power of music that still has on my mum who's 90 next year with dementia just reminds us that the music is is in there it's amongst our most cherished memories and experiences and is the key to uh, to the unlocks lots of other memories and thoughts that we've had throughout our lives. So I think that that's probably enough from me. Um, and um, I hope it was of some use and, and set the tone for, for this wonderful thing that you're all doing. And so um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you for, for sharing a really personal account of, of the impact that music's had on your life throughout your life. Now, I know if we were together in person, I'd be leading an absolutely huge round of applause right now. Um, but I'm sure I speak for everybody in saying thank you. Thanks for joining us. And I know for one, I'm certainly looking forward to reading Crossroads over Christmas. Um, thank you very much. Everybody buy the book, definitely. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite Professor Caroline Bithel back to kick off our lightning talks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anne-Marie. So if I could have the next slide, I'll just start with a few things about myself. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So these are the relevant bits. I joined the University of Manchester in 2005. My academic background is in ethnomusicology. I'm also a voice practitioner and I'm currently chair of the Natural Voice Network. My research specialisms include traditional music in Corsica and Georgia, that is Georgia in the Caucasus, the natural voice movement and community choirs, intercultural music making and singing for well-being. And a common theme running through all of this work is the power of music to sustain and transform lives. Next slide, please. Another book. You don't have to buy this one, you can now get it for free from Oxford University Press website. Um, in my book, A Different Voice, A Different Song, Reclaiming Community Through the Natural Voice and World Song, I delve into the world of open access community choirs, singing workshops, summer camps, and cross-cultural singing encounters where songs are taught and learnt by ear thereby making the health and well-being benefits of singing available to anyone, not only those who read music or may have had formal musical training. And I frame this in terms of democratisation, liberation, empowerment and transformation. So go to the website if you'd like to take a closer look. Thank you. Next slide. There's been a surge of interest in community choirs in recent years, and this has led also to a plethora of reports on the health and well-being benefits of singing. Some focus on generic benefits and others on the efficacy of singing in relation to specific health conditions or social challenges. So I've just put a few examples on this slide. Sing Yourself Better, the health and well-being benefits of singing in a choir. Benefits of group singing for community mental health and well-being. Music, singing and well-being in adults with diagnosed conditions or dementia. Lots more on dementia elsewhere. And Acquire in Every Care Home, great project. And this was a review of research on the value of singing for older people. Next slide, please. I'm now throwing in one of my favourite quotes from Stacey Horn's book, Imperfect Harmony, Finding Happiness, Singing with Others. She writes, group singing is cheaper than therapy, healthier than drinking, and certainly more fun than working out. It's the one thing in life where feeling better is pretty much guaranteed. You may or may not agree with every aspect of what she says there. 
I should note that imperfect here is a nod to the fact that you don't even need to be singing in perfect harmony in order to enjoy the benefits of singing. So let's take a closer look at how singing might be viewed as a workout. Next slide, please. Singing increase, exercises the lungs and heart. It helps tone the abdominal and intercostal muscles. It increases the oxygenation of the blood and it helps improve stamina and posture. Next slide. Some of this is due to physiological effects. So we're talking here about functions controlled by the involuntary autonomic nervous system. We see a rise in blood pressure and heart rate, increase in muscle tone, these are good things, a decrease in the electrical resistance of the skin and changes in the respiratory rate. These are things that can be measured scientifically. And for the last one, this also has knock-on effects. For example, people with pulmonary lung disease find that not only are they able to breathe more easily as a result of singing practice, but they can also walk further. So lifestyle changes as well. Next slide, please. So we can also talk about biological effects that are related to the so-called feel-good factor. We're looking here at links between music and the release of certain endorphins and neurotransmitters. So we see a release in oxytocin. This is the hormone associated with feelings of general well-being and the promotion of interpersonal intimacy, bonding, a sense of trust. An increase in serotonin and dopamine, these are neurotransmitters linked with feelings of satisfaction and pleasure. An increase in immunoglobulin A, this is a substance released by the immune system that is associated with positive or relaxing experiences. Conversely, we see a reduction in cortisol and in testosterone. So these are hormones linked respectively with emotional stress and often with aggressive or competitive tendencies. Next slide, please. So I'm now looking at psychological and emotional effects. Singing in a choir is just one activity that can produce a state that is characterized by the experience of being in flow, as it's put, or lost in the moment. A sense of deep absorption combined with expanded consciousness. A state where the sense of being alive is at its most intense. And this may be akin to an ecstatic or out of body experience. And it may also lead to a heightened sense of being connected to or in harmony with others. And these shared peak experiences then create lasting bonds with the other people you've shared them with. Next slide, please. So just a few words then on the collective as well as the individual health benefits. The collective health benefits derived from singing in a choir or other forms of music making, research into this has shown that strong social networks lead to increased happiness and resilience, and that happiness is not only addictive, but also contagious. And one consequence of this is that improved quality of life and emotional well being reduces pressure on the NHS and other services. Next slide, please. So I now move on to singing in the brain. Scientific research into music in the brain has also gathered momentum in recent times with studies unpicking the way in which music modifies the neural pathways and processes in the brain and so can improve both cognitive function and motor skills. Of particular relevance to our specific concerns today is the way in which listening to music as well as participating in making music improves mental alertness, concentration and memory, can unlock language and emotions and can facilitate routine daily tasks. Some of you may be familiar with the case of one of Oliver Sacks's patients who was immortalized as the man who mistook his wife for a hat, the title of one of Oliver's books. And Sacks describes how only when he was singing was he able to eat, bath and dress himself. And Sachs's prescription for this patient was, as he put it, 
a life that consisted entirely of music and singing. So here we have a bridge to the power of music in relation to dementia and other neurocognitive disorders. Next slide, please. Some of the most dramatic evidence of the power of music has indeed come from work in dementia care settings. Some of you may have seen the documentary, The Alzheimer's Choir, that aired on BBC Two back in 2009. Um, it featured a choir in Bristol that was associated with the Singing for the Brain initiative. And I just want to quote here from the blurb for the film. As the group bursts into song, an extraordinary thing happens. People who may not even recognize their own partner find the words of a song learned half a century earlier and suddenly, just for the length of time it takes to sing a few verses, it is impossible to tell who is the Alzheimer's patient and who is the carer. And we'll just go to my final slide, please. Thank you. A more recent landmark is Alive Inside. This is a documentary film that premiered at the 2014 Sundance Film Festival, where it also won the Audience Award. The film charts the work of social worker Dan Cohen and his organisation Music and Memory, who created personal playlists on iPods for people with dementia in nursing homes. Oliver Sacks, who features in this film, writes in his book Musicophilia of how music can rejoin the neural circuits and awaken post-encephalitic patients, quote, to alertness when they were lethargic, to normal movements when they were frozen, and to vivid emotions and memories, fantasies, whole identities, which were, for the most part, unavailable for them. Similar effects are shown quite dramatically in the film Alive Inside, which presents itself as, and I quote again, a joyous cinematic exploration of music's capacity to reawaken our souls, with the camera revealing how the healing power of music can triumph where prescription medication falls short. Music in relation to dementia has formed the basis of my recent collaboration with John Keady, from whom we're going to hear next, in our roles as joint supervisors under the auspices of the university's Simon Industrial Fellowship Scheme for Helena Bull of Manchester Camerata, who you will also be hearing from later in the proceedings today. So without further ado, I'd now like to hand over to John. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, that was such a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, is it possible to have the first slide? Would that be okay? Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to be with you for the next 10 minutes or so to talk about issues to do with moments and why moments matter and some of our recent thinking about moments, which I'd like to share with you. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, next slide, please. But before I do that, I'd like to, to uh, talk to you a little bit about myself and, and what right, if any, I've got here to be with you this afternoon. Um, if you look at the top of the slide, you can actually see a picture of me uh, with hair, which is quite unusual. But that was taken in, uh, in 1983 um, on the beach in Southend-on-Sea. And I'm actually with um, somebody with dementia. And I worked uh, at that time as a student mental health nurse. Uh, and I practiced and I was learning at Worley Hospital down in Brentwood in Essex. And I did that training for three years. And the first word that Wardley put us on was the psychogeriatric wards, which was a really lovely name. Uh, but it was 40 men with dementia. And that was the annual trip out uh, to the seaside. There was no other trips anywhere. And, um, and I was, what, 22 in 1983. And that was my first experience of meeting anybody with dementia. And I think in those days, we weren't supposed to enjoy the experience, but I connected with it in a way which has kept me going from the age of 22 to just about 60. Uh, and I'm still learning every day. I've got to say to you absolutely upfront, I am not a musician. Uh, my interest and, and abilities to be with you are to look at social research in dementia and how music has really been such an important part of that. And, but I'm very happy to say I continue to learn. I've worked in dementia since 1986 in lots of different uh, guises and contexts. I did my PhD part-time. I started it when I was a community mental health nurse in dementia care. Uh, my PhD, when I finished it, is my only degree. 
So I don't have that traditional academic background. I come very much from a practice background and I still have a joint appointment with the NHS in Greater Manchester. I lead the Dementia and Aging uh, Research Team, which I'll share with you in a little bit more about them in a moment. And I'm also an NIHR Senior Fellow, uh, which is a very grand title, but it means there's five of us who've come together in Manchester to really develop social care research. And Mark had such a wonderful introduction to, to today's programme, but he talked about people with dementia and his mother in a care home. And people with dementia in care homes are seen as social care, and that's why I'm able to connect to the um, NHR social care um, research. Next slide, please. So my day-to-day -day work is largely um, in the University of Manchester and the Trust. It started in 2009, the Dementia and Aging Research Team started in 2009, and we got 12 members, which is made up of PhD students, projects that we do, and also postdoctoral students. And we're predominantly a social research group, and that really means that we're interested in lived experience. So numbers is not something that we're very good at, though we do do research which has lots of numbers in it, but really what we enjoy is getting under the skin of people's lives. So to me, a, a good study would be four or five people followed through for about a year or a bit longer to understand how basically life is lived in the everyday and the complexities of that. And to do that, we use different methods such as videos and walking interviews and getting out and about with people and trying to make the research collaborative and as participatory as, as possible and to empower people living with dementia. That's very, very important to us. Uh, next slide, please. So this basically just illustrates that uh, philosophy that we have about everyday lived experience and also finding ways to engage people with dementia in our research. And there's a couple of um, little pictures on there and one of them is actually um, work on an animation by somebody with dementia about explaining what dementia is like through the generations to try to understand for her grandchildren what her own dementia is like. So what we try to do in our work is, is try to see various ways of getting that message across in different methods and different ways of explaining it, not only by words. And that's very, very important to us. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, a summary of some of the work that we've done with Manchester Camerata since 2014, when I first got involved with Manchester Camerata. And I have to say, pay homage to Nick Poncillo here. So thank you very much, Nick, for enabling us to, to work alongside Manchester Camerata in those early days. So this is, goes chronologically from the earliest to the latest, and I'll quickly go through them. We did a, in 2014, we did an evaluation on a, a Music in Mind a session that was held in a care home in Northwest England. Uh, Sarah Campbell led on that research. In 2015, we were successful with Christine Milligan at Lancaster University, and again with Nick and myself, uh, to have an ESRC case, and case is basically uh, ESRC language for an industrial partner, and in, in, in Machat Camerata was that, which we were able to, to think about developing a better understanding of music and what that means in people with dementia's lives. Robin Darwin was successful in that PhD studentship and, was, uh, and now works uh, in the Centre for Cultural Value at Leeds University, but she really led and innovated the methods and the ways and the creative ways of working alongside people with dementia, and she followed the Music in Mind programme uh, for 15 weeks. We've done an evaluation with Manchester Kilometers uh, Portraits for Place scheme, which was largely about younger people with dementia in Daisy Bank Road in Manchester. And the outcome of that can still be seen on the Manchester Camerata website, but it's also was a, an exhibition uh, at the Whitworth Art Gallery as well. Caroline Swarbrick uh, uh, led on a piece of work with Camerata, which was just fantastic. It was an animation that about 15 people with dementia did for about a year. Uh, about uh, a study on ageing in place and Camerata uh, soundtracked it, but alongside people with dementia. Uh, that animation can still be looked at. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of work and people with dementia didn't mention once that they had dementia until the very end. Uh, again, it's a very democratic way of working. And as um, Caroline shared, um, Helena uh, completed a Simon Industrial Fellowship earlier this year on the subject of younger people with dementia. Next slide, please. Part of this work has been around about framing it around moments. Being in the moment was something that came up time and time again in terms of the evaluation the structures of what, what makes music meaningful to people living with dementia. This is a, a book that was written by Christine Bryden. She was 46 years of age when this book was published. 
and it was called Who Will I Be When I Die? And this is just one of the passages from that book. I plan to enjoy each and every experience, even though I might not remember them from moment to moment. The experience of each moment will be enough for me. So again, that, that need to be present, to be here and now, not to think too much in the future, but to connect and communicate with what is happening at this very second in time. Next uh, slide, please. The same feelings in her next book uh, called Dancing with Dementia. I want to treasure each moment as if it were the only experience to look at and to wonder at. So again, people with dementia are telling us what's very important in their lives and what we should be looking at in terms of connecting to their lives and to their in-their-moment experiences, be that for music or be that from any other part of an arts-based activity. Next slide, please. So some very basic questions to ask ourselves about moments. It's uh, not scientific this, I just put them down, but what ma moments have mattered most to you in your life? And not all moments are pleasurable moments. We all experience some stressful moments in our lives or acts of bereavement or moments that, that again, we connect to in different types of ways. So why do those moments matter to you? How do we turn moments into memories? That's not just a new psychological process, but equally we memorialize our moments I've got photographs around me in my, in my little office here. We, we keep key moments and key people very close to us, even though, they may, even though time may have moved on. And one of those things is uh, what happens if significant life moments are misremembered or not even remembered at all? I had a, we had a little grandson born about six weeks ago and I kept thinking to myself, maybe in 15 years time, what would it be like if I didn't remember that event in my life? Not just to me, but also to those close to me. So misremembering key moments in your life has impacts not just for yourself, but for your social circle and your networks around you. And everyday moments matter. It's something I've become acutely aware of, I think if I've aged myself within this field, that what we do every day truly does matter. Next slide, please. This is a very um, academic slide at one level, but I just want to place it there because it's about the outcome of two very important reviews in dementia. Uh, Kate Gridley's work on life story and Bob Woods' work on reminiscence work. And basically what they're saying is that we have to move away from the past about this randomized control trials. And we have to think more creatively about what methods work. How can we connect to people with dementia in a different type of way? And how can we do that in the moment? What does that actually mean? Next slide, please. We tried to answer that question ourselves uh, really last year, uh, but this work has been going on for probably at least eight years. And we generated a, a, um, a definition of being in the moment because there wasn't one, not, not that we could find anyway. So this was work that was done by myself and Sarah Campbell and Robin Darwin's name is there as well, and colleagues and friends I've worked with for a number of years. It draws on our research work and it basically says this, being in the moment is a relational, embodied, and multi-sensory human experience. It is both situational, so it's about the now, and it's autobiographical, it's about us. And it can exist in a fleeting moment or for longer periods of time. All moments are considered to have personal significance, meaning, and worth. Next slide, please. This has led us to be thinking about generating a new research program based on the importance of moments, and that being in the moment actually ends. So again, some of our work for last year has to be to think about that. So it's not just being in the moment, but it's maybe a cyclical repeating of moments. Moments are created, we're in the moment, moments are ended, and moments can be relived or not. And I think for people with dementia, not being able to relive moments is okay. It's absolutely fine. It's just the importance that's, uh, that, that's placed on in the event. Uh, next slide, please. So what does that mean? So going forward with Matches Camera Office, we'd love to, to be able to take forward that opportunity to map moments through that creative cyclical way of, of the continuum of moments. But to measure it, this work took us over four years to generate. And it's 13 statements that we worked with, with about 300 different stakeholders, around about 50 people with dementia. And it was led by Siobhan Riley, my colleague at uh, Lancaster University, who's just taken over to be Professor of Dementia Studies in Bradford University. But these 13 statements were compiled largely alongside with and led by people with living with dementia, because you wanted to find out what mattered most to people with dementia living at home. What is it? So these 13 statements basically are there 
view to us about what matters most in their life? What can we capture? So it was about sustaining good relationships, about being able to communicate, to be feel safe and secure at home, to feel respected and valued by others, to be able to have a laugh with other people, to do things that you like doing, to keep interested in things. And I think eight and nine are really written by people with dementia saying, I want to be orientated to where I live as much as I can be. And if I'm not, I'd like you to connect me to that. To have self-care, to not fall at home, to have those multi-sensory areas of seeing, hearing and understanding where that is possible and feeling able to know who you are and keep your identity. Next slide, please. That's the academic paper. It was only published in 2020. It came out a few months ago. Uh, and, and it's probably the work I'm, I'm most proud of, uh, but I would very much like to take forward that work in the future if that was possible uh, with Manchester Camerata and their Music and Mind programme. Next slide, please. And that's my contribution. Thank you very much for listening uh, and, and enabling me to be part of this afternoon. Thank you. And now we're going to pass on to Virginia. Okay. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak today. And, um, and thank you, John, for a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. My, my talk offers another perspective on creative participation. In the next 10 minutes, I want to explore the concept of creative aging in 2020, briefly introduce Carter and create and the Creative Aging Development Agency, and just give you one example of a music related project. As I said, there's a lot of attention on older people at present. Much of it isn't positive, and the ageist coverage of the presidential election um, is a case in point. Over the last six months, um, the use of frail and vulnerable images of older people um, has contrasted direct, dramatically with those active older people like Ian pictured here who are serial volunteers, not afraid to assert their identity and are still making a contribution to their chosen communities. As an older person myself, I want to find grain analysis about just who older people are and um, not the la lazy media extremes of wealthy white baby boomers or pairs of wrinkly hands. Why is this important? You may be surprised to learn that some agencies class you as older at 50. Therefore, it's it is possible that you could spend another 50 years identified as an older person with all the negative connotations that this currently brings. While we may debate who is older, ageism is deeply rooted in our thinking and the poverty of vocabulary around aging demonstrates how little we discuss and explore it. Ironically, ageism is the one inequality that if we have a long life, we will all experience. And yet ageism is evident across our society and all of our structures, including the arts. Why are we prejudiced against our future selves? And why do we other older people? There are complex psychological reasons for this, but we must confront the inevitability of our aging society. There are already more people in the UK over 60 than under 16, um, than under 18, and the numbers are growing. We need to sharpen our thinking about aging well and the quality of life that we want for our parents and grandparents now and ourselves in the future. While some cultural organisations have been working with older people for decades, creative ageing is a relatively new discipline, as is the concept of age-friendly culture. Some would say that the wide range of objectives and intentions that these terms cover mean that this can't be described as a discipline or a sector, but all the activity under this umbrella can be united by the phrase, the right to end your days as a creatively engaged citizen. It's easy to dismiss creativity as a nice to have, but when everything was closed down during the spring and summer, a wide range of people of all ages discovered the value of everyday creativity, such as listening to music, writing and drawing to pass the time. Speaking to national organisations offering COVID emergency funding, they confirm anecdotally that while initial applications were for food banks and community hubs, the thrust of later applications shifted to requests for support for creative activities. 
This list demonstrates the type of activities that the term covers. Issues of health and well-being in terms of combating loneliness and building communities, as well as cultural rights, are woven into the ambitions and advocacy for the work. These activities offer therapeutic settings and a sense of flow through enjoyable distraction from the day to day. Much of the activity has been characterised by togetherness and belonging and creating social groups. As public spaces have closed down, I have watched with genuine admiration as specialist organisations and practitioners working with older people have transformed their practice in many ways for the better, both in the short and long term. There's been a rapid uh, development of ingenious, patient, creative work informed by detailed knowledge of locality or the needs of a particular group of people using hybrid methods of communication, including post, phone and radio. Some of this has been captured by the Bering Foundation's recent report, which considers those working in the field to be key workers. The findings detail both the changes in delivery and the impact of the pandemic on artists and participants. The cover of this report illustrates the Singing Hinnies, an informal group of musicians organised by Equal Arts up in Newcastle to perform to older people who were shielding in the spring and summer. They played in front gardens, streets and care homes and, car and care home car parks. The sprint that we thought we were on in terms of responding to the pandemic has now turned into a marathon and the new needs and challenges are emerging. Many of us with the skills and the hardware have been pushed into the global world and in some cases the drive to keep connected with creative activity has encouraged people to learn new skills. However, the digital divide is still deep and wide. Of the 450 older people in Greater Manchester, sorry, 450,000 older people in Greater Manchester, 160,000 are not online. And of those who are online, 58% of them don't use that medium for information or activity. Mainstream cultural institutions, when they reopened briefly, were struggling to reconnect with older audiences who, while previously a loyal core of attenders, are currently less confident about venturing into public spaces. This is the context that I found myself working in when I became director of CADA in March this year. I came to CADA, the Creative Aging Development Agency, following a career in cultural policy and strategy at a regional and national level. I completed a PhD at the university in 2018. So what is CADA and where has it come from? Here's a very short history. It's the legacy of the Bering Foundation's 10-year investment in creative ageing. Back in 2010, this charitable foundation chose to dedicate their arts funding to supporting this field, which they felt was overlooked and underinvested in. When this programme ended, they put out a national call to secure seed funding for the next three years to continue and develop this work. This funding was won by a Manchester consortium, rep reflecting the city's pioneering work in age-friendly communities. My post was initiated and is hosted by Manchester Museum, but my role is England wide and works, works across the arts and heritage. We're a sector support organisation, an advocate, researcher, partner, convener and campaigner. We're now looking on a handful, looking at a handful of strategic priorities to explore further, mindful of the changing environment. Our focus is on amplifying the voice of older people making creative work by minority communities visible, exploring digital possibilities and connecting practitioners to develop next practice. Over the next six months, we will begin to build CADA structure, resources, programme and connections to enable it to realise some of these ambitions. Finally, I just wanted to highlight a national project, Dance to Health, that has music and dance at its heart. And this seems so relevant to today's event. It has been five years in the making and brought health and arts professionals together to address falls prevention in a constructive and enjoyable way that has encouraged people to stick with the course. Created by ESOP, an organisation dedicated to arts enterprise for social purpose, it's created specific programmes of movement led by trained dance artists. 
this project has recognised that often falls prevention exercise is dull and that social dancing was actually not enough. It's created engaging activity that has reduced, reduced falls in the cohort by 58% and reduced hospital admissions from that group from an expected 35 to 13%. It's benefited already over a thousand participants and volunteers. With the local dance to health groups that were set up to deliver across the country no longer able to meet, the programme is going online but hopes to resume work in groups when circumstances allow. This initiative has demonstrated through evaluation how creativity can improve the health and well-being of older people and could be an opportunity for social prescribing. And on that note, and with apologies for having a problem at the beginning, I'd like to pass on to Bev Taylor. Thank you. Can you hear me, Virginia? Yes. Brilliant. OK, I haven't got any slides, people, but I'm going to just pick up uh, where Virginia left off on that dance foot to health um, and the social prescribing bit. So I've been leading social prescribing for the NHS for the last five years um, but since August I've been seconded to the National Academy for Social Prescribing um, to develop their activities. So I'm going to tell you what social prescribing is, I'm going to tell you about the link worker infrastructure that's being created across the whole of the NHS across primary care um, and I'm going to tell you about the new thriving communities program that was launched yesterday by the National Academy for Social Prescribing in partnership with some our regional voluntary sector uh, agencies and some national organizations, including the Arts Council. So what's social prescribing then? Um, it's quite simple. It's about connecting people to community support, um, but there's something really significant in there, which is, there's a new role that's emerged across the NHS and that's the, of a social prescribing link worker. So social prescribing link workers, they're based in primary care teams. They're often employed by voluntary and community organizations, but using NHS money. And what they do is they have time that others don't have. And they have time to um, take referrals from, from GPs, but from um, other people within the system, so from social workers or, or self-referral or from um, other agencies, e even the police and fire service, they take referrals, they work with people on what matters to them. They, under they, they build up trust and they understand what really drives a person and what they're worried about and what they want to connect to. So if somebody loves um, singing, that's the natural thing. If somebody loves cycling, if somebody loves football, if somebody's really worried about being evicted from their property or whatever, they work with whatever the person's telling them and they connect them to community support. Um, I want to just tell you, because I was with this woman yesterday, fantastic community leader called Pauline Kennedy, who's up in Fleetwood, She's the chair of Healthier Fleetwood. And Pauline said to um, our thriving communities group yesterday that um, she's got COPD and um, she got um, introduced to a community choir. She went along, she thought, I'll give it a try. Um, not only did it make it uh, feel better and enable her to breathe better and enable her to walk longer, um, Lo and behold, along the way, she somehow found herself as a community leader. She found that she had skills, she had friends, she had um, uh, abilities that she never really realized that she had. And now she's the chair of Healthier Fleetwood. Um, and guess what? She goes to the NHS a lot less. She needs um, services a lot less. She's too busy doing everything else in her life um, and being a fantastic supporter of others. We, th those stories are replicated across the country and that those stories along with the statistics about how being connected to community support does reduce pressure on the NHS enabled us to um, work with a cross-government team to de who developed the loneliness strategy and the NHS long-term plan 
so that over the next five years, there will be teams of social prescribing link workers in every primary care setting, in every primary care network, they're now called. Um, and the teams of link workers will work with community groups and organisations and with individuals to connect them up. So I'm incredibly proud of everybody who has developed that work and is developing that work along the way. And I should say that Greater Manchester is a beacon for social prescribing, that um, uh, there are some fantastic people in Greater Manchester Health and Care, including my great friend Giles Wilmore, who's leading social prescribing, who has um, been working with um, all the boroughs of Greater Manchester to develop um, social prescribing link worker services and support. Just a little bit more to tell you. So the Thriving Communities Network is about how do we encourage and nurture all those community activities and support all those community activists and leaders to um, do more, to be inspired and to learn from each other. So we're doing a number of things over the next few months. We're creating a Thriving Communities Network, which is a way of enabling people to see what others are doing um, and all the fantastic work that's happening across the country. We had 900 people um, on a webinar yesterday, um, all wanting to share their community stories, their community work. Um, we're developing something called Learning Together, which are regional learning programs for community leaders around how can we develop creative and uh, community support, particularly for those communities most impacted by COVID, the communities who are experiencing the greatest health inequalities. How can we support them to be more physically active, to be more creative and to use music along with lots of other things to um, live their best lives? And one, a couple of last things from me. One is, um, we're just about to launch on the 23rd of November, a Thriving Communities Fund, which we've created with the Arts Council England. And the Thriving Communities Fund, it's not a huge fund, it's 1.4 million in total. And there'll be small grants of between 25 and 50,000 for um, community voluntary and uh, social enterprise organizations to create community partnerships. Uh, so that they can increase and extend community activities for those communities most impacted by COVID. So the, 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 the emphasis of that programme is building community partnerships across sectors and every um, partnership that we fund needs to have an arts and wellbeing element to it. So you might want to know about that folks. Um, one last thing from me, I think um, music and um, creativity has got a huge role to play in COVID recovery. And, and it just reminds me that um, the English National Opera um, uh, has developed this fantastic programme called ENO Breathe. And Breathe is about enabling people who've been in intensive care with COVID um, to uh, to help their rehabilitation by singing lullabies and by um, being part of a group where they can give each other a bit of support and encouragement as 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 their long recovery journeys um, uh, as they walk together down those paths. So um, social prescribing is here to stay. It's a powerful um, social movement. We're all part of it. We're all building it. The NHS is absolutely um, putting it at the forefront of reducing health inequalities and improving prevention. But this is not just a health thing. This is a life thing. This is for everybody to use creativity and support to um, live their best creative lives. And um, uh, let's build it as we move forward. Can I hand back over to Caroline, please? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so inspiring stuff. Thank you very much, Bev. 
So I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for some really inspiring talks, helping us get a lot of pieces of the jigsaw on the table. And we've already got quite a few interesting links there across the material that's adding up to a really nice focus. So we have a short break scheduled at the moment. So if you would like to leave your video and um, microphone switched off, grab a coffee, have a quick stretch or whatever. Could we be back in 10 minutes? So this is by 2.15 by my laptop clock. We then have a presentation on the work of Manchester Camerata. There are some really interesting points being made in the chat at the moment as well, some really important issues. So feel free to keep adding to the chat and we can come back to some of those points for our discussion later on in the afternoon. Thank you for your attention so far. See you in 10 minutes. So welcome back. I hope you've had time to recharge your batteries and or your coffee pot. I've still got ringing in my ears uh, those wonderful words from Bev. This is not just about health, it's about life or something similar. And what is more important than life and what is more important than music for a lot of us in our lives. So keeping um, those thoughts in mind, our next fixture now is a showcase of some of the work of Manchester Camerata. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Helena Ball and Lizzie Hoskin. Lizzie heads up Camerata in the community and Helena is project manager and they're going to offer you some insight into the many ways in which music has helped enrich the lives of people they have worked with through their Camerata in the Community project. So thank you and over to Lizzie and Helena. Hi there everyone. Uh, it's really nice to not see everybody but it's lovely that so many people are here. Um, as Caroline just said, I'm head of Camerata in the Community. A bit of background about me, if you've been here from the start, um, you'll know that my background was in uh, producing radio music, uh, so for Six Music and Radio 2. Um, but I joined the Camerata back in January when the world was a bit of a different place. Uh, I'm really loving playing a small part in making a real difference to people's lives through music. Um, I saw this job advertised after I played in a string quartet in a care home in December last year. I could really see the amazing effects that music actually has for people living with dementia and their families. So working for Manchester Camerata just seemed like the perfect job to apply for really. So here I am. I'd like to introduce you to my lovely colleague, Helena. She's a project manager and she's been, uh, she's working here with me as well as part of our team. Over to you, Helena. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Helena. I'm a project manager with Camerata in the community. I've worked with Manchester Camerata for three years now. Um, I've worked within arts management for a few years uh, since I graduated from a classical music degree. I never wanted to pursue performance, whether solo or as an ensemble. I've, instead, I've sort of always enjoyed helping other people access music and, and find their own way to um, engage with that. Um, my role with Camerata in the community is to connect with people. Um, I feel very lucky that I get to meet new people very often, unfortunately not at the moment, but in real life in our workshops. And I often feel like my involvement in it is almost selfish because I feel like I get as much out of it as they do. I feel like it's a, it's a way to press the reset button, to press pause and just to remember exactly why I love music and why I started working in this way. As they say in all great briefings, um, it's the catchphrase of 2020. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, a bit about the uh, about Manchester Camerata. It's a freelance chamber orchestra. It was set up nearly 50 years ago in 1972. We're also a charity, so that means we have to fundraise for a lot of our work as well. Here's our mission statement. We make music that matters. We make music for change. Camerata does a lot of what you'd probably call traditional classical concerts, but we've also opened Glastonbury Festival, we've performed with Lewis Capaldi and played a load of gigs alongside some proper Manchester music legends like Peter Hook for all you Joy Division New Order fans out there. Um, and that's part of our Hacienda Classics concerts. 
So uh, Manchester Camerata in the community runs alongside this. We're a small team of three, but we have a much larger team of specially trained musicians and therapists who work with us as well. And all together, we create music for young people and their teachers in schools. And we also run music making sessions for people living with dementia and their carers. Last year, almost 12,000 people actively took part in our Camerata in the community workshops and about 10,000 people attended performances of our work. As Lizzie just mentioned, uh, at Camerata we make music that matters and we aim to make music for change. We've heard a lot about this before as well in Caroline's talk and from John and from Bev and from Mark as well. Um, but, you know, we uh, in Camerata in the community, um, we use music as a tool to improve people's quality of life and well-being. But what does that actually mean? Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. To give you some context about our work um, and about work in this area in general, the All Party Parliamentary Group released the Creative Health, Arts for Health and Wellbeing report in 2017. This was a two year research and evidence gathering project what, which set out to um, show the beneficial impact uh, of the arts and arts interventions on people's health and wellbeing. The main findings of this report show very clearly what impression the arts have on individual people's lives and therefore the effect it has on society as a whole. I've listed the three main findings from the report here. So the arts can help keep us well, aid our recovery and support longer lives better lived. The arts can help meet major challenges facing health and social care. Some of those might be ageing, long term health conditions, loneliness and mental health conditions. Finally, the arts can help save money in the health service and social care, as something Bev has already alluded to as well. There's a reference to the full report there at the bottom if you do want to find out more. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Music is in all of us. It's our heartbeats. It's the lullabies we're sung as a baby. It's the songs that we sing in the playgrounds and it's even the adverts that we hear on TV. It's surround us in our daily lives. We believe that our approach to music making is to give everyone an opportunity to find the musical voice they have within themselves and express that in whatever way they can or want to. We believe that everyone can therefore express themselves through music and that music doesn't have to be a very polished piece of music or a complete composition. It can simply be defined as the art of sound in time that expresses ideas and emotions. We put participants at the centre of the creative experience, allowing them to be in charge of how, when and what they contribute to the music making. This empowers them to make their own decisions. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, we're all creative to a certain degree, but we feel it's often trained out of us quite early on in school. Things like maths and English become a bit more important. So we want to grab hold of this creativity early on in life and hang on to it, just so it's there for when people become older and might need it to help with other aspects of their life. Our schools program began 20 years ago, just as extracurricular, I can't say that, extracurricular music, but it's now turned into this sort of fully immersive creative music making scheme, uh, which completely embeds music in the school curriculum. Next slide, please. So we want to give everyone an equal opportunity to access music making as well. This is really important, especially at a time when funding towards the arts in schools is quite far down their list of priorities. We want to make music normal and be part of the everyday. Another important aspect of our work is training teachers in how to teach classroom music. We want to leave a legacy of music making in the schools we work with too. So when primary school teachers are so fully immersed in this learning process alongside their class, both they and their pupils will both hopefully develop a mutual motivation and connection with the subject they're learning about. Anyway, enough of me, let's watch something we prepared earlier. So next slide please, and please press play. <laughs> Wow. 
when we were told we were working with Camerata, I kind of jumped to the chance because it was going to be like a chance to work in a different way than what we used to. Hi everyone, it's Dave here from Manchester Camerata. Today, we're going to be looking at using ciphers and codes to make our own music. The theme is Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement. The children have been involved in looking at creating lyrics. We don't really get the opportunity to work with other companies coming in. A lot of it's very internal. It will work with um, media students and music students, but it's really refreshing to have people from outside who we haven't actually worked with before. Seeing how the confidence has grown, seeing the pride that they've taken in creating their own song. When they sing the song, they can pick out the words that have come from their ideas. And they've just really, really enjoyed it and got so much more out of it than I would have expected. to watch it again if anyone else wants to. <laughs> I've seen that film a few times over the last few days and every time I see it I just I'm itching to get back out and to go and see people and to do something again. We wanted to share a specific example of one of our school projects which I think illustrates one of the different ways in which we use um, the idea of health and well-being in our work. This is quite a direct example. So in 2018 we delivered a music making project for primary schools in Tameside this was in partnership with Tameside Public Health and we were commissioned by them to do this work. The aim of this project was to engage young people in pressing health and wellbeing concerns quite prevalent in that borough. So the issues that we covered uh, were as follows. We looked at exercise, positivity, healthy eating, a happy, healthy home life, friendship and making new friends and getting enough sleep. The Peoples worked with Camerata musicians, composers and sound artists to compose new songs which formed uh, an album of health and well-being tracks. From this we created a teaching resource to help staff plan and deliver music and songwriting activities based around these topics. Teachers who took part in our evaluation throughout the project told us that the project helped them to have different conversations with their pupils about specific and often quite varying uh, health and well-being topics and different issues for their classes and that the songwriting approach created a safe environment where people were much more willing to participate. I'd like to share a story um, from the project. One of our musicians who delivered this work uh, told us about a particular pupil from one of the schools that they worked with. In one school there was a pupil who was obviously a real warrior in life. When they made their pocketbook of positivity in the workshop um, when they made their pocketbook of positivity in the workshop, they decided to call it their anti-worry book. They told me some of the things that they worried about and took a while to think of things that turned their mind away from this. But when they realised what it was and started to write them down in their book, they looked like the sun had just come out and started smiling. For the rest of the session, they were full of smiles and looked really confident. Next slide, please. So... The second part of our work is on music and dementia. Next slide. Thanks. So Music in Mind, that's our programme of Music and Dementia. Music in Mind encourages people living with dementia and carers to live well through music. Um, our Music in Mind programme started in 2012 and it's led by qualified music therapists, dementia specialists and our specially trained musicians from the orchestra. Our workshop sessions are focused on developing 
communication and interaction, even relationships and physical mobility, all are improved through musical improvisation. There's no right or wrong way of playing an instrument. Any interaction is meaningful. We also support care workers and like with our school, we want to leave a legacy of music making in care settings. Uh, as I said before, you'll get a much better idea from this film. So next slide, please, and then press play. <laughs> I like singing. I like the music that we do here, because there's no pressure. The idea is to pair up a music therapist like myself with one of the the orchestral musicians from the Manchester Camerata and deliver very interactive music making sessions. We've been coming here for the past uh, to the eight weeks or so and it has helped uh, as a lot, as a couple, it gives me time to spend with Patrick. The more they are able to join in with the music, the more they reconnect with themselves or connect with the people in the room, become aware of each other and feel this lovely sense of, of group music making. just before the film and as you heard some of our musicians and music therapists talking about in the film, Music in Mind uses improvisation to encourage people living with dementia to express themselves and communicate with others. Group members are offered different percussion instruments and improvisation commences by listening to the sounds being made in the room, sometimes unintentionally, and other people responding to them in their own instruments and on their, in their own way. These improvisations and music making sessions last for, can last for over an hour with different people exploring sounds in whatever way they choose. The smallest and most subtle of contributions to the music are valued and celebrated by not just our musicians and the music therapists, but by the other people in the group, friends, family and care workers. In some cases, it might be the only sound someone has made all day. It might also be the only choice they've been able to make for themselves all day as well. We've asked one of our group of musicians and the groups, uh, a group of people who take part in our Music in Mind programme to sum up their experience in one word. And we've put that together into our Music in Mind alphabet. We'd like to share with you just a few examples of what people came up with. Can we have the next few slides, please? Thank you. Like so many other projects and strands of work, not just within our organisation, but with other cultural organisations, our music and mind sessions and care homes ended quite abruptly at the result of lockdown in March this year. To allow us to continue working and providing support to our participants, we devised a new remote way of working called Music and Mind Remote. You can see a, a snippet of it here on the screen. This online programme gives carers training and music making resources to help them deliver their own music activities with residents they care for. In a time where care staff are feeling immense pressures to safeguard the well-being of the people that they do care for and themselves, we wanted to create opportunities for them to learn new skills which provide respite and entertainment for people that they care for and also themselves. Can I have the next slide please? Thank you. 
While public awareness of dementia as a whole has increased, the public understanding of younger onset or working age dementia still remains fairly limited. But we've been developing work in this area with colleagues from the University of Manchester since 2015. And as Caroline and John mentioned earlier, um, earlier this year, I took a Simon Industrial Fellowship with the university to explore this in greater depth. In 2018, Manchester Camerata and Louise Walwyn worked with health, health professionals, academics, artists, and most importantly, younger people living with dementia to create a piece of theatre and music called Hidden. Through performances of this work, we aim to raise awareness and understanding about younger onset dementia through these previously hidden voices. Throughout this project, we worked with a group in Wigan, where we explored different aspects of music, music making, songwriting, and sharing musical stories. One of our regular participants from this group shared their story with us and what they experienced during our projects um, and what sort of came before it as a bit of context for us. We've actually started a film project with this part as a participant, but like so many things, uh, the COVID lockdown has um, put, put an end to that for now. So for now, I would just like to share some of their story with you. I was diagnosed three years ago with frontal temporal dementia. I've nowhere to put new memories and soon get lost for words. After the diagnosis, we'd been introduced, introduced to groups in our area. We all join in and mix together and have made wonderful friends. It takes the dementia away for a while. At the very beginning, I felt like I was, if you can imagine, in a big pine forest, pine needles on the floor and a mist coming up as far as your neck. And just walking through the forest and trying to get somewhere that's relative to myself. But all that time, I've got this cloud hovering behind me, this big dark cloud. It was as though it was catching me all the time and I had to keep making an effort to get away from it and try and get into the light. And realistically, the light was this camerata group. I'm still coming to terms with having to, use, having to lose my driver's license, but everything is good now. The music is a new spark of life. Can I have the next slide, please? So as an organisation, uh, Manchester Camerata commissions a lot of research and also evaluation which guides, shapes and supports a lot of the work that we do. It's really important for people who work in healthcare and national governing bodies as well. It really shows how music and also Music in Mind workshops that we deliver really does help to improve the lives of people living with dementia. Since the start of Music in Mind, as you've already heard, we've worked closely with the University of Manchester, and the wonderful Professor John Keady in the Dementia and Ageing Research Team. Um, Helen just mentioned she's recently completed a Simon Industrial Fellowship in collaboration with the university, which focused on the benefits of uh, music for younger people with dementia. Uh, John's also supervised a PhD study by the now Dr Robin Dowland to look at the in the moment benefits of our workshop. So this means in, in the moment means how do you actually capture the experiences of people with dementia and also work out how they engage with music during the Music in Mind workshops. The outcomes of this PhD really showed how people can live a life story through music and be in the moment be with music. It also showed how the benefits of music ripples into their everyday lives. Next slide, please. So our connections, you can see a nice little display of them all there, our connections with other external partners plays a really strong part in developing our community work too. We deliver our Music in Mind programme to a network of care homes and housing associations. We're also connected to the NHS, Dementia United, the British Council and so on. We're a charity, so our work relies a lot on funding by local, regional, regional and national trusts and foundations health and social care providers, and in the last month, the Government's Innovate UK Fund. It's important, I think, for arts and healthcare organisations to work so closely together because they both have different areas of expertise, both come in from different angles. So by combining forces, this really helps to give the people taking part the best possible experience and support. We have the next and final slide, please. Thanks. So we wanted to leave you with a final thought today um, from one of our recent projects. We worked with the Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust to work with adults who attend the Recovery, Ad Recovery Academy, 
which is a centre in Presswich in North Manchester, which provides education and resources to people with mental health conditions. The group composed a song and a poem about moving forwards and making positive changes within difficult relationships. And I'd like to share the poem that they wrote. Dear Music, thank you for helping us communicate without words and talk in a different way, for allowing us to make new friends and build a community without prejudice, anxiety or stress, to focus on the sounds and the rhythms of the present. Dear Music, thank you for clearing my head, healing my heart and lifting my spirits. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation today. It's been such a wonderful uh, opportunity to be part of this. Yeah, it's been really good. Um, thanks everyone for listening to our presentation. Um, I've seen a couple of questions pop up uh, in the chat. Uh, feel free to email Helena and I after this, if you like, um, just about the Music in Mind resource. At the moment it's in a pilot stage, so we're trialing it uh, with lots of care workers so um, if you're interested, please email us in this and we can let you know what's happening in the near future with it. Thanks very much. Great. So thank you very much to Helena and Lizzie for offering us such a colourful and heartwarming entree into your world and the communities that you work with and also such wonderful insights into the ways in which many of the principles that we've been running through are being put into practice quite close to home for many of us and in our own time, strange as it is. And one of the things that just struck me most as you went through your slides was just the number of smiling faces and that really palpable sense of joy, which is just so wonderful to see and so inspiring. So thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure we can come back to, to some of these issues and questions in our discussion time, which we'll get to shortly. So we're now moving into our panel discussion and audience Q&A. This is going to be facilitated by Tim Steiner. So I'm now going to hand over to Tim. I'm going to let you, Tim, say a few words about yourself alongside introducing the other panellists and then off you go. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm sure you'll agree so far. There's so much stuff to think about. Um, uh, so much inspiring stuff, both in terms of the research and those wonderful films and um, uh, uh, um, presentations that we've had so far. <clears throat> Myself, I am a, uh, a musician who, for the past 30 years, I've worked uh, in communities and with communities. I worked with Manchester Camerata throughout the 90s in the very early days of setting up and training musicians um, there when we uh, kind of sowed a few of the seeds of the stuff that sort of now flourished with such incredible um, effects. And... Uh, my speciality really as a musician is about bringing communities together, people from very different types of background. Uh, I work a lot with people with uh, dementia, um, people with stroke, I run a programme with that. But I'm particularly interested in what happens when you bring people together who perhaps might be classed as being vulnerable for whatever reason, together with people who... Uh, for whatever reasons are classed as not being vulnerable, when you start mixing communities together and the effects that you have, particularly I'm interested in what happens when you bring young people together with older people and the benefits of that. Now we have in our panel uh, this afternoon five excellent um, speakers, We've uh, some of whom we've heard of, um, heard from so far. We have uh, Becca, pa Becky Parnell, uh, Gaynor Butler, John, Dr John Keady, who we heard from earlier, the wonderful Janet Fulton, many of you will be familiar with, um, already, and also Bridget Swalting, um, uh, the music therapist who's working with the uh, Music in Mind programme at the Manchester Camerata. I will introduce each of them as we go through. Um, each of them is going to talk, um, I'm going to say now, on the topic of their own choosing. It's their speciality. They know loads of stuff, um, but they're going to talk uh, enthusiastically and passionately about one thing that is uh, close to them and dear to them. Then I'm going to set them a question, a pre- prepared questions but I reserve the right to adjust those questions um, in response to what they're saying and what we would like the rest of you to be doing is to be active on the chat so we're looking for good inspiring um, questions uh, for those panelists to open up the discussion which will continue for uh, the rest of the afternoon now I believe uh, we're starting with Becky Becky Parnell um, 
And uh, Becky, I'm going to leave it to you just to um, introduce yourself a little bit and to um, talk, if you will. So, Becky. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tim. Yes, so my name is Becky Parnell. I work in a dual role with Creative Manchester and Manchester Camerata. I'm a, a concert producer and I undertake research and knowledge exchange between both organisations. So I'm primarily involved in putting concerts together rather than the health and well-being um, side of our activity. I've prepared a few very brief slides. Um, if you don't mind popping them up on screen, please. Thank you. Great, thank Great. you. Um, and as Tim mentioned, I'm gonna be speaking about something close to my heart, um, which is all about formal concerts and presentation and whether formal concerts can be seen as a form of well-being. So we've heard from speakers today looking at the positive impacts of participating in music activities and the power of listening to music. But I'd like to ask whether concert attendance can be classed as a well-being activity. And if so, how would we as an orchestra begin to promote it as such? So I think a good starting point to help us answer this question would be to examine the reasons why people choose to attend live orchestral concerts. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So I won't go into this in too much depth, but the South Bank Centre in London commissioned research in 1997, which neatly summarises some motivations for concert attendance. And from this list, we can see there are several motivations which probably aren't related to well-being. So broadening repertoire and getting dressed up, for example. But I would argue that many of these motivations here are intrinsically linked to well-being. So harmony of mind and body, nourishment, sense of humanity and human warmth. Next slide, please. So the question of whether formal concerts um, can be considered as well-being activities was posed at a recent discussion group that myself and Tim held with musicians, academics and health and well-being practitioners from across the country. And the results were really interesting. And when we asked the question, two of the musicians came back with the following quotes. I'd have said so, yes, because you're communicating with the audience. They've chosen to come to listen and watch, as well as see people creating live. And I think that's a building up of the importance of community, of being together, which we're missing so much at the moment, is that being together, experiencing. That in itself is well-being. And another musician responded, I think I'd add to that, the whole point is you're transporting people away from their normal existence and hopefully getting them to connect with their own emotional state in a way that they won't do just watching TV or being at work. I think it's just such a different experience for people. So these responses from musicians, orchestral musicians, echo the motivations from the South Bank Centre's research that concerts can assist with providing people's social and emotional needs. And we can compare these responses with the outcomes of a Manchester Camerata project in care homes, which is very much what we would consider to be a traditional health and wellbeing project. The main two outcomes of this particular project were, aside from increased musical ability, a strengthened sense of community and improved mood and enjoyment, which again ties back in with the motivations for attending formal concerts. Next slide, please. So if the benefits of attending concerts are so closely linked to health and well-being, what's stopping people from attending? And this has been the subject of so much study and the barriers to concert attendance are often discussed at length within the industry. So I'm not going to touch on that today. And many orchestras have developed a series of relaxed or informal concerts, which remove many of the traditional barriers to attendance. But there is a perception amongst some concert goers that these informal concerts are seen as having less artistic value uh, than concerts at which all formal concert traditions are adhered to. So I mean sitting in silence in a concert hall. I've just begun to work with the Centre for Cultural Value at the University of Leeds, and I'm about to undertake a pilot project for their new Collaborate Fund, which is a fund for projects which aim to investigate cultural value. And as part of this, I will be paired with an academic for one year. 
during which time I intend to investigate the value that both relaxed and formal concerts can bring to the lives of attendees. And we've seen that concert attendance can provide a wide range of benefits, which is similar to taking part in a health and wellbeing music project. And my aim with this research is to hopefully find a new method of concert presentation, which can be of equal enjoyment to somebody who may find traditional concerts uncomfortable and somebody who is well versed in the formalities of traditional concerts. Thank you very much. Um, great, thanks, uh, Becky. Um, uh, really good to hear you talk about that and those great um, quotes from musicians that uh, you gave us. Uh, I would say I would like to suggest that um, everybody on the uh, discussion this afternoon would agree that going to a concert is is fantastic. We love that thing. Um, I remember um, a text written by Benjamin Britten back in the 1950s that described going to a concert all about the business of also getting dressed up and buying your tickets and all of that that kind of stuff. And now we know that's good. Uh, we know there are um, uh, reasons and um, that people don't go to concerts. But at the moment, obviously for the past eight months, um, people haven't been able to go to concerts. All musicians want to get back to playing concerts. But uh, is that do we definitely want and this is i'm i'm a this is a devil's advocate question do we definitely want live music we've always had it and we're used to going to it but for the past eight months we haven't had it um and particularly with the case of vulnerable people is it always the best scenario to go to a best concert so uh, my question really is to you is is a live a live music activities always better mm. Okay, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, when Manchester Cam Camerata premiered its first uh, film last month, which featured musical performances and specially commissioned poetry, we set out to create a piece of digital content um, with very high production values, specifically for that reason, obviously, because we're not able to go into the concert hall or wherever else we would perform. We wanted to create something that would provide a meaningful experience for audience members. Um, but prior to commencing the work, prior to begin making the film, we did quite a lot of research into streamed concerts and digital content. We were looking at the practicalities, so choice of platform, monetization, tickets, etc., but also looking at data around audiences and their experiences in the digital concert space. As I'm sure many of you won't be surprised, there really wasn't a lot of information about this. It hasn't really been studied very much. Um, there has been some interesting research by Martin Barker on streamed theatre events, which was of great interest to me. Uh, his research found that even if no other aspect of liveness matters, it's simultaneity that does. It's this experience of all being together at the same time um, and building up that anticipation of going to something. It's exactly what you were saying, Tim, about Benjamin Britten and that anticipation of, of buying a ticket. Um, so that feeds into being part of a community. And of course, going back to the motivations uh, list that I showed earlier, there's so many motivations on that list that can't be experienced in a digital space, human warmth, etc. But what we can do, I think, is to make sure that as technology advances with virtual reality, augmented reality, and all the other amazing stuff that's happening at the moment, we refer back to the original motivations and reasons why people attend concerts and workshops. And we do our best to find ways to include them in our digital events moving forward as things progress. OK, that's um, that's great. Uh, very well said. Some lots of interesting uh, points that you've raised there, Becky, eh, that we could discuss in more detail now, but we're going to move on. Um, we've got four, uh, five speakers to hear from. So I'm going to move on now to uh, Gaynor Butler. I'm going to hand over to you, Gaynor, to introduce yourself and to uh, talk as passionately as you like. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, so hi, everybody. It's uh, lovely to um, see you all 
although it looks like I'm looking at you, but I can't see you, um, such is the technology. Um, so my name is Gaina Butler and I am a project manager and I work for NHS um, Greater Manchester. So I work across the whole of Greater Manchester. And um, my role in the NHS is as part of the um, Dementia United team. So Dementia United is a um, project of work which has a five-year um, lifespan, I guess. Um, so it began in 2016 and it will end in March next year. Um, so it was a, a programme of work to facilitate all things dementia related and services um, really to try and bring some standardization in of services and to try and address some of the inequality um, of services, postcode lottery, that kind of thing um, in dementia related services for Greater Manchester. So um, it's a very big program of work that focuses a lot around all aspects of dementia um, so I'm not going to go into any of that detail now because I'd like to tell you about something that I find really exciting about, about the project. So as part of the project, um, continuously and throughout, we have engaged as much as we could with people with lived experience. So those who are living with a diagnosis of dementia or those that care for them. And we, we've, we're very proud about doing that because it's really important to when you're talking about services, um, particularly clinical services, that you involve the people that it actually affects and impacts at the end of the day to make sure that you, you get the right perspective and any proposed changes that you're making, that you're making the right ones. So we, we do a lot of bringing people together to talk about things, I suppose, is to put it very bluntly. And one of the ways that we are trying to understand what it's like to live with dementia and to really understand what it's like to live with dementia. So hearing from the people who are going through it on a daily basis is by um, trying to capture what we're calling um, moments of their their lives basically um i suppose for once we're because everybody's different and people everybody's moments will be different to them so we have developed in conjunction with some partners um a, a digital platform i will call it um which is going to help to capture those moments for people and to give us a full understanding and a real deep understanding into the things that actually matter to people that's living with dementia. Um, we know that a lot, of, through talking to people, we know that a lot of things that matter are the things that take place outside of the healthcare setting. So it's out in the communities and people's daily lives. And it's about trying to get some evidence of what those things are and also to help inform any commissioning of services in the future. So the best part of my work is, is engaging with the voluntary sector organisations who are supporting these people um, across Greater Manchester, living with dementia and carers, because then we're hearing it straight from the horse's mouth about, about the things that actually matter to them. And I know that, um, or, or my experience has been from speaking to people that um, arts, music, um, all of those kind of things are, are are really, really important to people in helping them live with the disease as well as they possibly can. And um, so I'm going to leave it there, if that's all right, Tim. I don't want to rumble on too much, but if you do want to know any more details about the project, um, then my details will be shared at the end. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Gaynor. Um, uh, your project was new to me and I've looked at it. It, seems, it looks really fascinating. Um, uh, incredibly interesting, potentially very, very powerful. Um, a lot of people this afternoon have spoken about being about being in the moment. I, th I would say the the term the word moment has been used more than any other word uh, throughout the afternoon, um, and I think that's a key thing. Um, the idea of documenting moments, I think, is an is a really intriguing one. And I'm thinking about the communities that I work with. Uh, I think it's a thing I'm certainly going to take forward from this afternoon. Um, but perhaps you could comment a little or talk a little on the relationship between 
the idea of capturing or remembering moments, lived moments, things from the past, and the kind of the creation or the living of new new moments. Um, if that makes sense, Gaynor? Yeah, absolutely. And I think both of those are vital, not not just to people living with dementia, but to everybody. Um, and I, I include myself in that. I, th I think that, you know, when, when we think about reminiscence, which is a term that's used a lot in the dementia world, um, with people's older memories tending to survive at the later stages of dementia, um, more than the recent memories. And, and also um, Mark touched on that about it when he was referencing his mum, couldn't remember what she'd had at a, at a last meal, but could remember years ago. And what what we what we have the ability to do as human beings is recall the those memories and the feelings that go with them, um, and and that never leaves us, um, which is really powerful. So reminiscence and and any kind of talking about memories good times you've had it is it is always good for the soul whether you live with dementia or not um but it's also really important to continue to celebrate the moments like john said every moment in every day is that opportunity to do that and i think what music in particular does for people with dementia is it creates those moments you know, we the, the heartwarming stories that I hear about um, the care home setting where they've brought in a musician or they've been doing the sessions like the Camerata and somebody has gone from being very still and quiet in a chair to upon hearing the music has become this other person tapping the foot. Um, you know, the person that you thought you'd lost can come alive with that music. And to capture that, and hopefully have that as a record um, for you, not for yourself to just look back on, but maybe your loved ones or your family that might not be there locally. And especially during COVID, when people haven't been able to visit in person in care homes, then being able to capture all of that information digitally is really, really powerful. And I think it would help to bring some comfort to the people that can't visit. Does that answer your question? I think that's a, that's a really strong point that you made just at the end there, which uh, perhaps we haven't talked about much this afternoon, is the, the relationship between people with um, dementia and their and their wider families, which is, you know, at the moment, as uh, people not being able to get together. But we know, those of us that are involved in working with people with dementia, that we, we share with them these incredibly special moments when suddenly someone does sing for the first time in a long yeah. time or remember something or smile but that their uh their children are missing that sometimes and their partners and yeah. um, to have a forum within which you can actually remember that moment and then share those moments with uh, the family i think is a really useful uh, a useful thing to think about um great work thank you absolutely thank you let's move we're going to move on now to uh john keady who we heard uh speak a little earlier on um over to you john Oh, thank you very much. Well, I think you've probably heard enough of me, to be honest. I think I haven't changed. I'm still a mental health nurse and uh, I've been in the field since 1986. So um, uh, in different capacities and, and different ways of working alongside people with dementia. Some of them institutional and some of them I'd like to think of as liberating. Um, and I work at the University of Manchester and I have a joint appointment with Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Social Care Trust. Is there anything else you want me to talk about? I'm sorry. I... Uh, no, John, I think um, I'm really interested. You said one thing when you were talking earlier. Uh, you were quite clear about the fact that you weren't a musician. Now, I know I know what you mean by that. And I'm sure lots of people here would uh, sympathise with you as well. When you're working alongside musicians of uh, the class of the Manchester Camerata musicians, uh, m many people then suddenly there is a bit of a feeling there who, oh, I'm not I'm not a proper musician. I hear that all the time. And I'm sure people here have said that I'm not a proper musician like like you are. But obviously you've worked um, with musicians and uh, you, I'm sure you would agree that everyone is a musician. I don't know. I'm saying I'm, I, I'm saying that everyone is a musician. Everyone can sing. Everyone can play music. Um, I'm wondering if, in your experience, if you have any thoughts about the importance of creativity in music, uh, uh, meaning the business of 
creating and making something new as opposed to a uh, more reminiscence kind of music work which i think when i was starting out in the you know in the late 80s it was uh, work with uh, people with dementia was all about singing old songs um now that's work st still does go on but i know that those old songs are uh, largely songs from my youth um whereas they used to be songs from the 40s so what's that relationship about being you know what what's creativity in music for people with dementia it's a fascinating question tim and thank you for asking us um, I think I have to start with a bit of a myth, and that's that we've got a long history in dementia research that looks at music, especially qualitative aspects of it, that sort of social lived experience. We're still uncovering and discovering. And I think that's, I think I, I can't, I can't let this go by and just say we have a store of knowledge that we're going to draw on. We are at a moment, I think, in time where we can create new knowledge and we can create new collaborative and insights into the meaning of music. Uh, and it's lab and it's um, you know relationship with other art forms as well. But what I've seen, and I remember, gosh, I'm, I'm kind of old enough to remember um, going to conferences in the early 1990s, and I remember seeing Tom Kitwood speak uh, when he was alive. And Tom Kitwood um, would talk a lot about the importance of person-centered care, and it led on to his really classic work from 1997 on dementia reconsidered, the person comes first. And I remember starting some research work at those early days where people with dementia were involved in the research. And that was different. That was, that was totally new. You just didn't do that because dementia was about the carer's experience. And I think changing the narrative and changing the, the tone around so that we, we could actually put the person with lived experience first is incredibly important. It was, it was a game changer, I think. Uh, Tom died in 1998 and too soon to see the fruits of all his work really in many ways. Um, but that sort of attachment and closeness, and if you read the very first book on Dementia Reconsidered, there's a, there's a picture on page 61, if I remember, which has got somebody with dementia playing the violin. And that was the epit epitome of person-centered care, of keeping the person connected to their environment and to themselves. Uh, a way of being which was really about, this is what we're aiming for. This is good quality dementia care, whatever that actually means. So I think it's, I think in many ways, that sort of attachment to music uh, the way the creativity has is 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 absolutely within us all. But we published a paper two years ago looking at something called little C creativity, trying to get away a little bit from from museums and galleries and thinking about the creativity of the person. That's that sociological concept, um, uh, you know, little C creativity. What is that? And so we've been trying to put that out there into dementia and saying this has got a real role and a purpose, but we need to understand more about it. And I think what we're seeing and, and the, those wonderful slides that Leslie and Helena uh, shared was about that connectivity, that, that connections to the moment, to the experience of just having an experience and being connected to one another. And I think that for people with dementia um, has something that moved me. And I, I, why I wanted to say I wasn't a musician was because I'm not, but I could see the power of basically the person with dementia in a group form um, with the power to transform, not just themselves, but other people. And that, that is a rare event in most people with dementia's lives. And that happens through camerata. It's a very beautiful thing. It's a very emotional thing. And it's a very liberating thing for the person. And I think that those connections are strong and they come from a center of us, which is very creative. We are creative beings and we can't forget that. It's just another way of actually assimilating whatever we are uh, as we journey through life. But how you research that is a different thing altogether. That's, that's a chart. <laughs> um, when you work it out, John, uh, you must let us know. Um, <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. You speak so well and so clearly on, um, on that and uh, managing to kind of encapsulate uh, quite difficult concepts, I think. I think it's not, I mean, it's not straightforward at all is it we're in we can be in sessions with people with dementia we know something's happening we know something great is happening but it's very difficult to put your finger on exactly what that is and why it is and where the heart of it heart of it is um thank you let's move on now to um janet fulton um so uh janet we're over to you thank you very much tim so hi, I'm Janet. I've been working for decades with the Manchester Camerata as we've tried to serve our communities. 
And um, I also, since March, have been continuing to serve the communities by working for the NHS full time as a 111 call handler. And I've been volunteering for the Yorkshire Ambulance Service for 10 years. But that's a different subject because what I want to talk about now is music is an inspirational language. It can be understood by individuals and communities all over the world. It gives power and voice to the oppressed. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, and a means of expressing joy and happiness. I'm walking on sunshine, whoa, or sorrow and sadness all by myself, don't wanna be. It reaches across barriers that restrict normal language and understanding. It is communication at its finest, an enabler, Always look on the bright side of life. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. An engager. If you're happy and you know you clap your hands. An enticer. Music invites us to open up to ourselves and to each other. We use it at important moments of our lives. The soundtrack we choose to get us through childbirth. I will survive! The music of the first baby sound. It is carefully chosen at weddings. No, and funerals. Family gatherings, happy birthday to you. Celebrations, congratulations, congratulations. We use it on special occasions. We sing to cheer our teams on. And in the interest of fairness, when you walk through the blue moon, you saw me standing a glory, glory man united. When we are born, it turns out that we have the innate ability to react to pulse and to rhythm. Little ones rock and roll literally to the beat. Society in Britain tends to drill this out of us. But those living with dementia lose that self-awareness and just get back on with reacting physically to sound. Thankfully, thankfully due to programming like... <laughs> moving to music is starting to become quite the norm again. Um, and I found that if you dance down the aisles in the shopping, you know, in the shopping aisles, it's fantastic for keeping self social distancing. Just a little hint there. People with dementia can sing when they have lost the power of speech. There was a lady on one of the first sessions we ever did a music in mind session. She hadn't spoken or used, spoke, you know, used her, her vocal cords for over a year. She was just curled up listening to the whole session. And as, as the session ended and people were packing up, she suddenly started to sing a wordless melody. It was even maybe, this was maybe about seven years ago, I can still remember that moment. It was so moving. And even the other people living with dementia in the room realized how special it was. Everybody just stopped and listened and the staff were just crying, crying because they knew what it, the significance of this was. My dad would talk about the importance of furnishing the mind, building up a store of positive and lasting things that we can hold on to, whatever life, and in particular at the moment, COVID, throws at us. Music is a big store of just that and can be used to help build and repair, to relax and meditate, enabling health and well-being individually. It, we don't tend to lose it even when we are living with dementia. At a Hacienda classical gig, the physicality of music and movement produces endorphins and a collective sense, a collective sense of well-being. And look how young people have unfortunately defied lockdowns in order to continue to experience this. And the silence may be at a Royal Albert Hall held together with an amazing shared silence after a moving musical number. That's always just building up a positiveness and building of memories. So above all, music 
is an expression, I feel, a language of love. And it brings people together into a shared experience of that love. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, I, feel, I feel certain you could carry on all afternoon. Um, uh, if, mm, uh, if possibly. If, if we, if we <laughs> wished, or perhaps you're exhausted. Um, one thing that struck me, actually, when you do, um, uh, I'm not quite sure how many uh, little uh, extracts or samples of music that you included in your presentation, but there were very, there were very many. And they actually demonstrated one of the key, those key phenomena of music, which uh, many people have mentioned this afternoon, is that they can in a, it can in an instant take you into another another mindset, back to another time. Um, and you had that even with like little snippets there when you did the um, only look on the bright side of life. I think that was the second or third that you put in, which was the from life of Brian. Am I right? Or have I imagined that? Yes, that one there. And that <clears throat> whenever I hear that song, it always takes me right back to being a kid and hearing that for the first time. And it's so powerful. Um, one of the things that uh, I know that permeates lots of your work is your, um, your, you have this incredible ability to be able to excite people and enliven people um, in your work. So I'm interested to know, and I, uh, perhaps this is a selfish question, because it's a thing I struggle with, with myself, of how you work with people, particularly people who, um, with dementia, who are uh, perhaps resistant to wanting to be able to let go. I mean, you, you, you talk very clearly about how um, with dementia, um, people with dementia, sometimes they lose some of those learnt responses to, uh, to pulse and rhythm and become far more natural with their engagement to it. But we all know there are people that we meet who uh, will be uh, of increasingly resistant to letting go of those things. I wonder if you've had experience of that and if so how you how you work with that if that makes sense Janet yeah okay so within the music in mind setting um, it is uh, it is invitation only in the sense that we invite people to do whatever they want and then we follow on so it's like you go through the door and we'll follow type thing so and I mean no engagement means that they they have the choice of leaving the group we, we would never ever force anybody to stay in a group if they really really do not want to um some people seem to be completely passive and withdrawn and um you know kind of scowling and what have you but won't choose to go and that in itself that choice of not leaving the room is is like an opening about all the time they are in charge. So if they don't want to do anything, they don't do it. If they do want to do something, we do it with alongside them, we copy them, we uh, work 
you know, alongside them, we try and exaggerate small movements that they're doing, and then they kind of reflect that back. And so those movements get better. So they're getting more physicality and, um, and so on and so forth. But all the time they are in charge. So you can never have a situation where they are being forced to do anything that they don't want to do. Um, and I suppose it's that idea of music being enticing, you know, is that sometimes, uh, particularly, I mean, we're lucky, of course, you know, like, uh, you know, say, John, say I'm not a, not a musician. Well, of course, we have got the most amazing musicians at the Manchester Camerata, not me, but, you know, the others. And they are absolutely incredible. So, of course, if somebody comes in with a French horn, like Naomi, and starts playing it, well, everyone's going to be going, what's that? And, and so sometimes you've just got to look for something that's going to interest them is going to be some kind of communication, sound communication that they're going to be interested in. And then you can work from that. But always, always, it's a question of just invitation and then them leading um, within those groups. That's great. That's very clear. Janet, do you, um, it, uh, I mean, that's completely down the person centered uh, approach that John was talking about earlier. Um, do you, it, is it like a journey of discovery sometimes then those sessions of uh, like searching and exploring and finding those moments of connection with people? Yeah, I, I suppose that is a good way of, of putting it, really, that uh, because nothing in Music of Mind is planned. We don't go with a list of anything in there other than to 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 be an enabler, really. That's the only thing that, you know, that's the only task that we have. So the, the session can go in any direction. Um, I mean, if, start, if somebody starts singing the Manchester City theme tune, for example, we will go with that and we will flow, but then we won't finish at the end. We'll kind of go into something similar musically wise and then see what other people then pick up. And, and of course, particularly with dementia, when it is so kind of bringing you um, into yourself, anything that enables each of us within the group to start connecting with each other and listening to each other and acknowledging that there are other people in the room that's another thing that, of course, music does so well, um, particularly if somebody's playing full tilt with a drum or something. <laughs> it's a bit obvious <laughs> what they're doing to everybody else in the rest of the room. But, you know, so you've got, uh, but as I say, you're just all the time, you're waiting to see. And I mean, people start, I mean, there was a, a, a guy, elderly guy, um, started uh, playing the drum every single session. And we just assumed that he must have played drums in the past. As it happened, his granddaughter worked in the same care home and she was coming to the sessions and saying, but he's never played anything in his life. And yet there he was, you know. So he ought to have been obviously in his past life playing while he, while he had the opportunity now. And there he was, he was off, he was doing it. So yes, it, anything can happen. Great. Uh, thank you, Janet. A, a terrific comment on the um, uh, the chat here of just pointing out the halo that is naturally positioned <laughs> behind your head on your screen. Um, uh, completely by accident, but I'm um, uh, very, very noticed. Uh, now, um, it's a good moment to hand then over to um, Bridget, also works as part of that programme. So over to you. Thank you, Tim. What can I say? <laughs> oh, that was wonderful, Janet. And it takes me back. <laughs> I was going to talk about music in mind as well, but before I start and tell you about my involvement with it, um, can we all just take a little moment? And I'm so happy that the moment has featured so big in this event, because um, I think a lot of what we experience are special moments and not just special moments for the people with dementia, but for us as well. So can we all take a moment to think back of a memorable moment in that involves live music. So um, tricky at the time, but even if you have to dig deep, um, try and conjure something up where you were moved by live music or whether you were moving or clapping or dancing, playing or singing, whatever, and hold on to that, please. So, um, I think I can safely say that the day back in 2014, when a cellist friend came to my house to tell me about the work which her orchestra, the Manchester Camerata, was doing with people who had dementia, that day was a bit of a game changer in my work. Manchester Camerata was actually looking for a music therapist for Music in Mind at the time. And I felt very attracted by the possibility 
of collaborating with first rate musicians to improve the quality of life for people who had dementia. After many years of working in quite a, a lonely or isolated profession, at least sometimes, it seemed like glimpsing the promised land. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> in the years to come, nine different, totally amazing string, wind, percussion players, you've just met one of them, have teamed up with me and together we've gone into care homes and community centers and brought live music making to people who have dementia. The Music in Mind way of working, live, spontaneous, responsive, improvised, inclusive, with a high level professional musical background, has been beneficial to individuals, groups, staff and places. The benefits have ranged from reduction in antipsychotic medication to residents opening their mouths to speak or sing again, as we've heard now several times. What became clear to me very quickly was that the musical relationship between the two practitioners, the music therapist and the musician, was the elastic band. If you imagine, you stretch music like an elastic band until it can include everybody, the whole group, every person in the room. There has been interest in this uh, way of working, um, not just nationally, but internationally. I was invited to Japan to do a workshop and we presented Music in Mind at one of the National uh, British Association for Music Therapists conferences one or two years ago. Live improvised music is flexible. It can be influenced by any player at any time into any direction, style, speed or volume to suit the need of the group. As long as we listen to each other, we can not only sing and play our favorites, but also create something new and original. Recently, a neighbor of mine whose husband had been diagnosed with dementia asked me how we used music in the Music in Mind sessions. When I explained to her what happens, she was surprised. And she said, so it's like you're counteracting a person's loss of confidence by facilitating positive and successful interaction in music. And I thought I really, really like this because it highlights the psychological aspect which is so important for someone who experiences failure and loss and gradual decrease of cognitive faculties. By participating actively in the music making, each person adds value, significance and meaning to the music. But it works the other way around as well. By participating actively in the music, the music gives worth, significance, and meaning to that person. And then there's the depth of a shared experience. We've also heard that term a few times. Um, and whether it's an experience of joy or nostalgia or longing or even pain, it's shared and it creates the connection. And here we link back to the moment that maybe you thought of earlier on uh, your special moment of live music that that and, and you remember that shared feeling of which gives us a sense of belonging and uplift. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the shared experience thing is very strong. That's a theme that's been coming out. And I think we'll return to that in a little bit. Um, I. Uh, uh, you 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 talk you say you talked about live spontaneous improvised um, uh, kind of flow of work with it and so um, I know how fantastic the musicians with the Manchester Camerata are but broadly um, my question is around the role of improvisation so if you were to look uh, amongst musicians around the world and think I want some great improvisers to work with 
I, I would suspect you the first choice wouldn't be to go to a, um, a collection of classical musicians who, broadly speaking, aren't trained as improvisers or, or uh, in some ways, spontaneous, flexible musicians. I don't want to stereotype uh, the whole profession, but, that, but ballpark, those aren't things that we associate with classical musicians. So what clearly the musicians that you work with aren't, uh, uh, you know, are, are incredibly um, spontaneous and able to improvise but what is it particularly about working with these musicians that brings you something that perhaps uh, improvising specialists might not be able to bring interesting question Tim thank you um, I think looking back uh, what's been so marvelous has been working with somebody with a fantastic ear really broad knowledge of of music incredible mastery of their instrument, but the improvisation, the dreaded I word, <laughs> um, it's, I think for some it's been, it's been a challenge and they were perfectly honest about it and said, I, I don't feel that I'm good at improvising, but I want to try. And then it's been a wonderful, so, so there's been a, a sense of curiosity and a desire to broaden practice and to widen the the experience and that in itself I think is is a really really lovely thing to to um to work together on and some of course some of the colleagues are fantastic improvisers you could not imagine how they could be topped in any way so it's um it's again it's it's a it's a variety of experiences but it's always a journey together you start on a project and um, because we don't know each other and we don't know each other as musicians. So it's always a getting to know and finding the way of how you can um, conduct this project together in the most effective way. And that's always interesting, always exciting. That's a, a connecting a, a little to um, the stuff that Janet was touching on this, uh, although this idea of an exploration and that the yeah. journey, which I think is really interesting there. It's not it's not a journey or an exploration just with people with dementia. It's actually the whole team together that are exploring. Uh, and I'm I'm sensing there, although you didn't explicitly say it, of um, whether there is a significant uh, impact of health and well-being upon the musicians of the Manchester Camerata in that session as well those that are confronting a, a fear of improvisation or exploring new ways of working in that way the payoff for that as professionals has uh, surely got to be quite profound as well I, I would imagine yeah mm. um we've had um we need to wrap up fairly soon we've had some uh, there's been a lot of questions and stuff on the chat i'm not sure whether the chat is available at the end of the session or whether it's able to log the stuff from the chat it might be um, worth uh, uh, Amory looking at that um, or um, in some way um, uh, there's more than um, uh, we're able to uh, uh, do here but there was a question here about the kind there was a question about the kind of questions that you can ask and someone was asking what kind of questions do you include do you include in feedback sessions for attending creative sessions which I guess really is a question about evaluation how do you how do you know that the the uh the what you think is happening to people actually is happening so people come out of a session they say yeah that was great i had a great time how do you know how do you know they really are having a great time um i'm not sure who that question is directed to would someone like to take that on from the panel i'm happy to start if, if that sounds yes. all right yes um so just a bit about how Camarasa actually collects um, evaluation and Lizzie, I can't see you on screen, unfortunately, but please do chip in as well because I don't want to, to hog the mic as, it, uh, as one might think. Um, so we, 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 we try and put together our ultimate aims for the project. So whether that is quite a tangible aim of um, creating a piece of music, um, creating a piece of art, something like that. Um, and we sort of work backwards from that to think about the experience that our participants might get. We try and capture the data in lots of different ways, um, trying to be creative like our projects are as well. So not just asking for written or verbal feedback, which might not be most appropriate for the people who we're working with, 
but through the songs that they write, the music that they make as well, and sort of documenting it by photos and videos as well. I think over the years, we've been able to work with some really incredible academics, researchers, evaluators, who really influence the way in which we collect our evaluation as well. And Lizzie said so brilliantly in, in our presentation that, you know, working in partnership, you, you respect the skills and um, specialisms of other people. And I think that sort of blended approach of combining what, what we aim to get out of a project from Camerata's perspective, but tailoring that to the experience of the individuals helps us to capture that feedback. Hopefully that's made sense. <laughs> It sounds incredibly thorough, and um, it, it's it's good to hear. Um, I think it's the combination for me. I think it's really important to have that combination of quite rigorous, thorough uh, evaluation along alongside the kind of like the chats that you have as you're finishing a session and, and having a cup of tea with people when you get some of the most profound and interesting um, uh, um, combinations. There's a bit of chat coming on on the uh, uh at the moment about styles of styles of music um and um whether whether particular styles are more important or more useful than others i'm thinking i'm getting and i, I would i would anticipate that the majority of the panel would agree that if something is very person-centered it's that person who has the response to music and we can't second guess what that response would be uh, and it's a mistake to try to input a piece of music expecting a certain kind of response and failing to respond to the way that people are with respect to the music that's being that's being played uh, i think very often as i navigate this kind of territory of my father my father's uh in his 80s he's a lifelong academic a very uh, stern forthright chap and i'm often thinking how would my father be in one of these sessions and i usually think my father will be hating this at the moment and it always makes me step back and think because he hates the idea of being in a group. He hates singing. He hates sharing the idea of any joy that he has with anybody that he doesn't know. And I always find that quite, quite a, quite a challenge. Now I don't think we've got time and space to explore that uh, here at the moment. But I want to sum up just a few of the main things that I've got, and I'm going, going to go right back to uh, the opening address from uh, Mark Radcliffe. Mark, of course, always speaks so incredibly well and um, he began by setting out this idea of the nature of music as being a, th uh, a kind of a thing by which we live our lives and it made me think of actually uh, radio is a thing I've been listening to uh, you know Mark Radcliffe on the radio for a long long time and there's a sense of that bringing comfort the sound of a voice on the radio as well as the sound of of music but it carries us through but they also talked about adversity in music and how that can lead us to uh, new discoveries. And at the moment, we're in this situation whereby COVID has meant we've had this lockdown and that's created a lot of challenges. It's adversity for all of us, but that has led to an enormous amount of new positive outcomes, as far as I can see it. And even looking at this forum this afternoon, I would suggest that had we not had covid and the lockdown eight months ago we wouldn't have 150 or 200 people sharing a zoom really comfortably online now to be able to discuss these things in the same kind of way uh, and uh, it's interesting that even with something like that the absence of being able to meet people face to face that that has actually created a, a community in which a lot of people feel more comfortable so one of the things that we know about many people with dementia um, which was highlighted earlier on was like they want to feel comfortable where they are and there's nowhere people feel more comfortable than actually in their own home surrounded by their own things many of you mentioned and talked about this idea of being in the moment and i think that's one of the strongest things to take forward the thing about being in the moment and embracing and celebrating that moment whatever it is and it could be two people just doing a bit of like washing up some cups at the end of the session together and having a nice chat and sharing there or the moment of euphoria as everyone is singing in multiple keys in multiple tempos more or less the same song but not always and loving that moment for for what it is 
Um, a few of you have talked about the shared experience, which strikes me as being very important. When we're online in this session here, this is a shared experience. We're not in the same space, but it's important the fact that we're all doing this at the moment. We're not watching a review of this thing happening yesterday or the day before. It's that shared experience that we get of going to a concert that we have in a workshop, we have in a session in a care home, but we also have in a session such as this. We're sharing this moment all together. Um, and I think the uh, finally, just like end up on some of the, um, uh, as Janet was uh, talked about the process of love, which is, uh, it's a loaded term, love. But I think when you're working with people in music, which is person-centered, that is where it lies. It's about caring for, naturally caring for with integrity, the feelings, aspirations, and motivations of that person that you're working with at that time, in that place with all the things that are going wrong it's not about the past it's not about the future it's about that moment and the crux of that moment there so with that i'd like to um uh, give my thanks to the five panelists um and for those of you that have been very active on the chat as well with all um, incredible things to say um uh, and uh, i'm i think that will go on now we are going to move on to a different phase when you're going to have a chance to discuss some of those issues in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to hand back over to Caroline now, who I think is going to take us forward from this point. Over to you, Caroline. Absolutely. So I'm the continuity again. So thank you very much to Tim for his expert pulling together of various threads and, and drawing out some really, really interesting thoughts and insights from our fantastic panelists again. So as Tim says, we've now got the opportunity to continue some of this discussion. So if you can hold some of the thoughts and questions that have appeared in the chat um, during the last half hour or so, we can take those with us into the breakout rooms. So you will very shortly, in a minute or so, be assigned to a breakout room. We'll stay there for up to about 20 minutes. The rooms have been randomly allocated. There isn't an agenda, but there will be a facilitator in each room who will make themselves known to you and they will help to oil the cogs of the discussion. So do feel free to switch on your camera. It would be really nice to see who's in the room and not just their names. Don't forget to switch your microphone on and contribute in whatever way you feel comfortable. We won't be having a monitor to report back to the main session, but the facilitator will just note down any new thoughts, ideas, connections, things we want to emphasize as we go along. And they'll just record those points and feed them back to us later. And we can then add them to the chat and take them forward to our own discussions and projects that follow on from today. So you'll go to the breakout rooms in a minute. You will be notified when the session is about to draw to a close. And then as if by magic, we will all find our way back into the main room for the last five or 10 minutes. I think we're all here. So welcome back to the real world, as it were. And I hope you had lots of things to talk about. We could have gone on talking for twice as long, I think. So it was a pleasure to meet a few more new people from far and wide. So I hope you've had a chance to enjoy some fruitful discussions. As I say, we'll add a few thoughts to our notes from the day and, and take them forward to help develop our own thoughts. We, we wanted to use this workshop in part to explore different approaches to deepening our understanding of the meaning of music making and to offer some insights and gain additional insights into different ways of evaluating the impact and the rewards of musical participation. And also, as I think we've done, to underline the case for enabling the greatest possible number of people to have access to these opportunities to make music so that they can then benefit, not just from the music itself, but from the health and well-being benefits of music. Why would you keep all of that locked up um, behind closed doors? Um, it's really, really important. It's not just about the music itself. It's about the health and well-being benefits, the social benefits, the connections, the community, all of those things that have, have come up a lot that, that really do change people's lives. So thank you for adding to the pot, as it were, of those experiences. 
Just a few words before we close then. Albert Schweitzer is credited with the observation that there are two means of refuge from the misery of life, music and cats. So I don't know too much about cats. I think the cat cafe is closed at the moment along with everything else, but the power of music has certainly been felt in new ways during the long months of lockdown as we've found new ways to connect with other people, people we knew before and people we didn't know before through music, as well as using music as an anchor in our own lives. And much of what we talked about in my breakout room was the silver linings that have come along with the, the lockdown being foisted upon us, as it were. Um, getting to grips with the technology while finding our way around in the virtual world may have been a steep learning curve. Um, thank goodness we had the technology. What would it have been like 20 or 30 years ago, I often wonder. But it's certainly been heartening to see the myriad ways in which music continues to fulfill its fundamental role in supporting individual and collective well-being. And just going back to, to something that was said earlier that John was saying in the panel, in adapting our ways of working, we're actually making history as we create new knowledge as well as new practices. And those are things that will stay with us. We won't just go back to normal and forget all of this. We'll take new methods of working with us. We'll take new connections. We won't suddenly drop the people who weren't able to access music making opportunities before. They're now part of our community. They're part of our friends. We'll find ways of keeping them with us and adapting our activities. Um, accordingly. And I think that's really exciting. And, you know, that's, that's something completely new in the history of, uh, well, the world, <laughs> life, the universe and everything, but certainly ways of working and of thinking about connections, community, accessibility, and so on and so forth. So we've got lots of thoughts to take away. I hope you've got food for further thought. I certainly have. So as we draw to a close then, I'd like to thank once again, all of our speakers, our panelists for their fantastic contributions, which I think worked so well together as we stitched up our patchwork quilt this afternoon. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for your own contributions to the discussion. We won't forget the things that are in the chat. We'll take those with us as well. So I hope you've found it worthwhile. I hope that we might see you again at some future events. Keep in touch, keep an eye on the Creative Manchester website, um, keep an eye on our social media. We'll let you know when we're next up to some tricks, as it were. So thank you very much for being here and we hope you will go well and safely be inspired, keep the music going. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to spend this afternoon with you. Thank you.